Welcome to our Saturday simulcast, joined by Brian Newbert, and we'll be talking some hoops today, a lot, a lot of going on in the world of Purdue men's basketball especially. I want to thank our sponsor, the Union Club Hotel, 811 Bistro, Boiler Up Bar. We're going to have a special appearance next Thursday night. Tom Deanhart and me will be at the Boiler Up Bar to preview the Purdue-Iowa game and talk Purdue football and more. Uh, that will be, uh, again, next Thursday night, Boiler Up Bar. Hope you can join us or join us on Facebook Live. All right, Brian, uh, goldenblack.com is the place to be. And uh, you did a file of report just a little while ago about Purdue's secret scrimmage played at uh, Marion College in Indianapolis when Purdue took on Cincinnati. Uh, just some highlights there. And uh, it's not always so secret, uh, but uh, it uh, ended up being, it sounds like a Purdue victory. But what details do you have to share? Yeah, my first take is to we need to stop calling these secret scrimmages because <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone cares anymore. Right. Um, I, I tend to call them just private scrimmages just because they're they're behind closed doors. Nobody really can go. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that industrious folks like me don't have ways to find out what happened uh, or people willing to help them, which is, you know, you're only in these jobs. You're only as good as the people who are willing to help you. So. Um, Purdue won by uh, 13. I think it was 77 to 64, something like that. Purdue was up pretty uh, significantly at halftime and into the second half. And I guess kind of Cincinnati made a little bit of a run. Uh, it's my understanding it was a very physical game. It was a very ugly game, scrimmage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Cincinnati did run a lot of pressure at Purdue, especially in the first half, a lot of zone press. Purdue had no issue with it whatsoever. Um, the combination of these two things are really significant. It was a really physical game. Cincinnati pressured in the context of Purdue needing to develop its young guards and fast track their development. That's really significant. That being said, no one ever looks at these things as the end all be all. Purdue has lost these things before and gone on to have great seasons. Um, it doesn't matter. Matt Painter doesn't coach these things to win. He coaches these things to, um, develop his team and uh I all that being said I think the outcome was was pretty favorable uh in in terms of what happened in terms of the experience that Purdue got out of this and that's the most important part with all these things well certainly the storyline is going to be and everybody will be watching because that's what we do in terms of Braden Smith, uh, the freshman port, point guard Fletcher lawyer two freshmen in the backcourt that are going to make a difference um, not only just today, but just what your observations have been of those two and just also the newcomers that are going to make a difference on this 2022-23 team. Yeah, I think the thing about Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer is they're both sort of those consummate coaches' kids, those guys who've grown up around the game, who've really invested a lot of themselves in the game, who are going to be advanced walking in the door, uh, who are going to – things are going to come natural to them. Uh, whereas it might not come as naturally to a lot of other players with different kind of upbringings in the game. That being said, it's still the physical part of it. It's still a huge jump uh, in terms of the level of play, in terms of the level of competition, the speed of the game, the caliber of the competition every single night. Um, so there's, of course, going to be a learning curve there. I think that their learning curve is a little – flatter than it would be for a lot of other players just because of their natural wiring. Um, but I think both of those guys have a chance to be really, really high impact players uh, for Purdue to the point where we could sit here and, and throw out our tape on the season. One of those could be, you know, I'm not sure Purdue goes any farther than where their two freshman point guards can, or two freshman guards can take them because they're really going to need a lot from both of those guys, both from a productivity perspective, but also a reliability perspective. They need those guys as ready as possible um, to be really kind of leading men for this team because what, what vacated from last year's team is pretty considerable and what's coming in is pretty inexperienced. And uh, this sort of experience is precisely what those guys needed precisely the reason why Purdue wanted a team like Cincinnati uh, precisely why Purdue philosophically has moved toward these scrimmages uh, instead of that second exhibition game uh, simply to sell tickets because this is a better developmental experience uh, than anything that um, you know 
not to pick on Truman State here next week, but anything that Truman State can can present to you. Yeah, no doubt. That uh, seems to me to be a good strategic decision. And like you said, mm-hmm. Purdue's had varied experiences. And it seems like the Boilermakers over the years, again, not that it matters, has lost more of these than they've won, if my memory's right. I know they lost what last year at West Virginia, as I recall, but, uh, and they've had several against West Virginia. Um, certainly, Caleb First and Trey Kaufman Wren, though, uh, may not have been in the starting lineup, may not be in the starting lineup, but two guys that could make a big difference. Uh, talk about their development and what to, how important you know we a lot obviously a lot of emphasis in the backcourt but these are two guys with a high level talent that uh, one uh, obviously first will be a sophomore this year but uh, Kaufman Wren will be a freshman eligibility wise but uh, talk about their development and what you've seen of them so far yeah I mean both of those guys are really good they're both gonna be really high impact players I, I think Caleb first is gonna be an all big 10 player sooner rather than later at Purdue and it was Trey Kaufman Wren today who leads them in scoring and rebounding right in less than 20 minutes off the bench, who really was the game's preeminent low post scorer in a game that, where Zach Eady also played. Uh, Zach Eady didn't have a great day. He was only three for 10 with three turnovers. Um, but Trey Kaufman ran, really had a lot of success scoring around the basket. I think those guys, those two guys coming off the bench, as I think they probably will uh, to start the season. Uh, Purdue did start Mason Gillis today, and Mason Gillis had sort of the consummate Mason Gillis game, six points on one shot. Uh, a bunch of <laughs> rebounds, uh, no turnovers. Um, it's sort of what he does, and it's sort of why I think he's he gets first crack at starting next to Zach Eady. But anyway, yeah. I think the first Kaufman Ren combo can be really good together, and I think they were there must have been something going on today that Trey Kaufman Ren had so much success off the bench that had something to do with playing alongside Caleb first too. First, uh, I think at one point uh, didn't really do a whole lot from a productivity perspective. Doesn't matter. Uh, Purdue knows what it's getting there. Uh, I think the the uh, complementary nature of both of those two guys can be something that really transforms this team when they get into the rotations off the bench. And you know, Zach Eady's your best player. Zach Eady's your most important player. Zach Eady is the player that everything's built around. When he comes out of the game, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm even ready to say that there's there's a considerable drop off because I think. The different things Purdue can do uh, with those two young forwards um, and how those two can play together and the complementary nature of their skill sets, I I think, is something that Purdue can not only use to offset ED being on the bench, but maybe even gain some net positive out of it because you can play a very different way and you can you can give other teams a lot more a lot of different things to worry about. Yeah, those guys uh, certainly bring you bring a producer. That's one thing I think is an interesting storyline, and you've mentioned about just the way this team can play different ways and a lot of different combinations and a lot of guys with skill sets that uh, that uh, will make a difference. David Jenkins Jr. I didn't really notice anything on what, on what he may have brought to the table, if anything, and I don't know. Uh, just your overall comments about how. Uh, and, and I know we're going to have a, a preview podcast on Tuesday uh, for the season as well, but uh, just a little bit about his development and maybe how he fits in uh, into the rotation. Uh, six points, no turnovers, I think, in yeah. in a relatively even minute share with other guys. I can't tell you how well he played. I know Purdue yeah. had no issues with pressure. Uh that that reflects well on all the guards. Um yeah. I don't know how much, you know, ball handling he did, anything like that. Um, but I, I don't, I don't see any any red flags in terms of his his stat line. At least I think you know he's a guy who kind of fits into that backup point guard mix. Uh, I, I think kind of as more of that game manager that Ethan Morton and you know Fletcher Lawyer to a lesser extent will will also be in sort of that veritable cast of thousands. Purdue's going to run out there when Braden Smith's yeah. not on the floor. Um, I don't think you have to ask too much of him in that regard. I don't think you need him to be a playmaker. You just need him to make good decisions. You need him to make open shots. You need him to guard. You need him to translate his energy, his personality, his charisma onto this team. Uh, I think that's where he can really make a difference for these guys. I think he's he's a big personality. He's got a lot of energy. And I think Purdue could use that. And anytime you've played basically – six years in college basketball, basically a third of his lo- or a fourth of his life at this point, more than a third of his life as a college basketball player. You've been through a lot of things. I think that experience 
can maybe help in some small way, provided he's that's how he wires himself to contribute to this team. Uh, every indication I've seen is that he will he will try to be a good leader for this team, things like that. Um, but gives Purdue another shot maker, gives Purdue a big physical guard on what will be a relatively physical team. But also you have younger guards who, you know, might not be the most physical guys right away. You're also going to have, you know, the opportunity at times to run out there 6'6", six, six, Ethan Morton, you know, 200-pound Brandon Newman, 200-plus pound David Jenkins. So there's some some things there, too, where, you know, th- there are going to be some situations where you can run some guys out there who are going to take the fight to the opponent in the backcourt, too, as opposed to, you know, ha- having to respond to what opponents are trying to do to Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer. Yeah, big, a big uh, component, certainly a big uh, plus uh, with respect to this team. All right, November schedule is an interesting thing. You've been through many of them over the years. La- <clears throat> last year seemed to be very challenging, and uh, Purdue obviously had a team that was built to do that. This year's on paper, yes, you have Marquette, and you're going to, I think, end or start, I guess, maybe the first day or so of December in against Florida State, and you will obviously go to Portland. But talk about that and just what – what if you were looking at that month? What uh, Purdue needs to get out of that as it develops, uh, and as this team maybe continues to develop into what might may become if they develop at the right level, a team that's capable of a, a top five finish in the Big Ten. Yeah, you just need to get better. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to keep drawing parallels between this season and 2019, where Purdue overhauled in a similar manner uh, to this team and didn't beat a not didn't beat a high major opponent in non-conference play. Now you'd prefer it to be the other way because all of those games matter when it comes to your resume, but those experiences, you know, were sort of the the catalyst to Purdue really sort starting to click right around the start of big 10 play. Right. And that, that team obviously went on to win the big 10 generated enough momentum to almost go to the final four. I don't know, you know, if, if this team has, the sort of ceiling to do that, but I never would have said that team had that had a ceiling to do that either. And right. it did. I, I think, you know, I, I, I think fans are going to have to kind of set their jaws for some ups and downs in non-conference play. I think Purdue's going to have to set their jaw for some, some ups and downs in non-conference play and sort of to use a bad sports cliche that these days kind of embrace the process. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think the non-conference schedule is almost ideal for this team, for this particular specific team. Uh, I know people want the Dukes and the North Carolinas and the and the whoever it might be on the schedule every year to get excited, but I think getting West Virginia again for like the seventh time in the last fifteen <laughs> years, whatever it is, I think that's a really good deal. I think getting Florida State in the uh, or the, I'm sorry, the, the annual Big Ten ACC matchup with Florida State and the semi annual uh, Gavit Games matchup with Marquette, I think those worked out okay because. Um, those are teams that are going to, you know, try to apply some pressure in the backcourt. That's what you need to Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, where you really want Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer to be come January. Uh, so I think while this might not be the sexiest non-conference schedule, they do have they do they do have Gonzaga, you know. So it's yeah, not I like mean they, 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 they have they blood better, on their yeah, schedule. I don't, yeah, exactly. they just don't have that. They just don't have that game at least in Mackey Arena, that everyone circles on their calendar. Um, But they have good developmental games. They have good contextual games in terms of what this team needs and how this team can best get better uh, at at the time of the year where they're going to have to get better. You remember uh, that season I referenced before. It was Florida State. Purdue had them beat. It got away. And then, you know, from there on out, you know, Purdue thrived in some of those situations where maybe they they failed at Florida State. I can't remember what some of those other games were. Um, but those sort of experiences need to ripple through your whole season. And uh, I think that's just, just the story of November for Purdue is just keep getting better, you know, keep – Keep under keep learning how to play with Zach Eady, how to make him the best player possible, and vice versa. Zach Eady has to get comfortable with these guys around him. He's got to get comfortable making offensive decisions. He's got to trust the people around him. Uh, Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, who uh, obviously, again, I mentioned before, maybe the story of Purdue's season, their onboarding, their, their development. Uh, those guys have to get better every day. Um I think, you know, Kaufman Wren and and, and Kate First playing together, 
you know, I think part of that's on Purdue's coaches too, to put them in the best positions possible to make them successful, do what they do best offensively and defensively. I think you can do some different things defensively with them too. Um, you can run an offense through Caleb first. You can run high low with those guys. That's going to be, that's going to be up to produce coaches, putting them in positions to really uh, thrive too, as much as it's going to be about those guys playing well. Obviously you, you need both parts of those equations, but I think that's another big part of November is how do those guys you know function together? Um, how do the backup point guard minutes function? How do you, how do you play when Braden Smith's not on the floor? Uh, I don't think that's a big deal. I don't think Purdue has ever been the most point guard centric offense in college basketball. Don't think it matters. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that in three weeks. We're just like, you know, this doesn't even matter. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the backup point guard issue might be one of them. Um, because is Ethan Morton or Fletcher Lawyer any less of a point guard than like Keaton Grant was or like PJ Thompson was? Um no, they're not. And Purdue won a hell of a lot of games with those guys playing point guard. Um, so, you know, it, it is going to be funny. It actually gives me a good idea for a content item. Here's the stuff we were talking about a month ago that just doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were talking about point guard two a couple of years ago with Nojel Eastern, who was basically a power forward, and uh, they damn near went to the final four. So, um, I just started talking there and lost control <laughs> over that. So feel f- well, and, and feel and, free to no, steer me back in a positive direction. I'm going to steer. No, and I and I and I misspoke. I mean, I don't think you can look at that November schedule and say it's anything close to a patsy because you're right. Gonzaga Gonzaga yeah. rolls in at number two. Uh, Purdue could play Duke in in game three. It's possible. Duke is ranked uh, seventh to start. So uh, there is uh, there is always those possibilities. Plus Florida. Out there, in addition to Xavier, you've got some good. I'm talking about the other side of the bracket. You've got uh, Purdue's going to have some good games out there, and I think um, I guess you'll you'll be able to tell something by the end of this November of where this basketball team is. But you're right. In 2018, 2019, Purdue was six and five after losing to Notre Dame, and you thought uh, in in the uh, in the wood or at the Indianapolis event, and you thought all might be lost, and you were right. Uh, Purdue came within a, a bounce of going to the final. Four. Yeah, and. One thing Matt Painter really likes is adversity. Yeah. And, okay, so for the first time, I shouldn't say the first time in their lives because I don't know, but, you know, your two freshman guards, Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, are going to be spending Thanksgiving with a college basketball team in Portland. Yeah. They're going to be playing a third game a day later, and then they play at Florida State like 36 hours later, basically. I don't know if it's 36 hours, but I know that it's like three days later they're playing on the opposite coast against a good team who's going to be really physical with them on the road in their first true road game. So as much as, as Matt Painter values, you know, adversity that time of year, that's kind of the face of adversity. That's the sort of experience that you learn about teams in. Yeah, no question. Yeah. You also learn about sports writers who have to come back from Portland and then get on a plane (laughs) and go right to Tallahassee. There you go. But see, I'm third. Yeah. Purdue will play at West, West Virginia Thursday night. Uh, Thanksgiving night, play Gonzaga or Portland State on Friday, and then come back Sunday and play that other side of the bracket we talked about. Then, like Brian said, Wednesday, November 30th at uh, at Florida State before coming home that Sunday to play Minnesota uh, for the Terry Dissinger bobblehead giveaway, no less, uh, on uh, that Sunday against Minnesota. Over and that's the exact sort of run where in 2019, Purdue got its head handed to it, remember? Right. They had to go right from Florida State yeah, they had to go right from Florida State to Michigan for the Big Ten opener, right? Um, which Purdue wasn't happy with the Big Ten sc- schedule makers over that. Um, but that's the sort of stuff that really matters. How do you handle those quick turnarounds against good opponents? How do you prepare, you know, before those games? That that's the sort of thing that's really going to catalyze uh, this team's development. Having to go through that kind of stuff, yeah. And now that I just changed our names on the on our Zoom cast, just so people would know who we are, right as we're about to come to an end. Do you have? Yeah, you're off to Brownsburg, and by the time this, many of you uh, process this information, uh, Brian will already have been down there. Who? You, tell us a little bit about who you're going to watch as we put this uh, to a close. Uh, I'm going to my sister-in-law's oh, yeah, house yeah. for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
if if Ken and he's going to, watch, he's to, going be, to there, be something really important. I, I if, thought, wait, who is he going to watch? Okay, you're not going good. If you're Brownsburg, going if Brownsburg native Ken and Catchings happens to walk by, okay, I'll. I didn't know I'll, it was catching or not. I'll cover that. No, okay, um, okay, uh, that's good. Uh, you're allowed to do that, by the way, <laughs> on your Saturday, and uh, uh, and that's part of the charm of this. Uh, this wonderful uh, Zoom cast podcast. I could have made something Ryan up there. will be in Brownsburg. Leave his house alone tonight, okay? There you go. So <laughs> that part is good. I, All right, Brian. I could uh, have made something up there and said, oh, I'm, go- I'm going to cover this or this, but I don't want people <laughs> clicking on our site tonight looking for coverage of yeah. uh, whatever no. it might have been. That's good about the Zoom cast. I can, I can turn myself red and you red at the same time. That's a good thing uh, from that standpoint. All right. So uh, we are going to bring this to a close. want to thank our sponsor, the uh, Purdue Union Club Hotel. Don't forget, next Thursday night, Tom Deanhart and myself will try to bring some level of levity and maybe a little bit of information on Purdue, Iowa. That game time will be announced, uh, uh, I think, on Sunday as well. We'll finally know when that is. But we'll be there Thursday night, 7 p.m., uh, Facebook Live as well. Also, like I said, uh, thank you. Thanks again to that'll be at the Boiler Up Bar at the Purdue Union Club Hotel. Also, don't forget to follow us and watch us on Twitter, goldenblack.com, a Facebook page. Always Golden important. Black to do, no Golden dots. Black Twitter Com, doesn't that, allow yeah, dots. That's, right. that's correct. Golden Black. I need I need a good correcting about every other minute here, but um make sure you do that. It, that becomes important these these days. Uh, as Brian does a, and Tom both do a great job of putting a, a lot of Purdue information out there on Golden Black Com, but also on our Facebook page. So thanks again uh, to Brian. Thanks again to the Union Club Hotel. And we'll see you next week, probably talking a little bit. We will be talking Purdue, Iowa football and that wrap up, but also some basketball because uh, there'll be a lot of that going on as Purdue opens up its exhibition season or o- opens and closes its exhibition s- season Wednesday night against Truman State as well. So hey, have a great week, everybody. Thanks again for processing and uh, keep watching us at um, uh, goldenblack.com and of course, Twitter, goldenblack.com and Facebook, goldenblack.com. We appreciate that. I have much. a suggestion. Yes, I, I think those, the, those, the shows you and Dean Hart do at the Union, at the Purdue Union Club Hotel, you should rebrand them as goldenblack.com open mic night. Yeah, we are. We are actually working on the uh, on the technical side. We might actually, so we don't sound like we're, we are in the whiskey room there. Great spot, but we're going to actually maybe improve our, so our sounds just a shade better. But we're going to get you out there too for, for that. So that's always a, always a favorite thing. So, all right, guys. It, guys, Brian, thanks again for everything. And we'll uh, see you next Mr. week uh, on what we will call the golden open black, mic night uh, open, open mic, mic night, night. And Get it like a rubber chicken sat- <laughs> and our saturday simulcast get Have one of those flowers out. that shoots water out of it <laughs> there you go <laughs>